You know, some things have been watching what's going on, and I'm really careful not to watch the wrong news and people that are putting stuff out. But uh, right now is a time that we all need to stay in faith like never before and stir it up. God is taking care of this, uh, and I don't want you to look at something to get your eyes off because the enemy is out there trying to get you to get your eyes off of God. Uh, but something that came to my heart this last week was how we need to be taking back our nation through the supernatural. Did Jesus operate in the supernatural? Should we? A couple of you, yeah, you, you agree with that. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to start out with some facts here. Uh, in the early church, the commitment of God's priorities produced excitement, activity, and power. As they were about the Father's business, they saw healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. So just a little bit of a history lesson here. Yet it wasn't long before purpose gave way to reason. Evangelism became bogged down in theological debate, religious performance, and ritual. All serious evangelism stopped by 90 to 100 A.D., 100 AD. In the book of Revelation, the church was being rebuked for its self-centered, non-committed state of being, Revelation 2 and 3. From all indications, evangelism stopped just a few year, short years after Jesus ascended. The apostles would have settled in another sect of Judaism had it not been for the persecution of the church. Acts 8.1 and Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And there were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Okay? So we've got this going on. We've got people persecuting the church. And what are we going to do? Well, the center of all Christianity... Christian activity shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch. And we see the beginning of the ministry of the Apostle Paul in Acts 13. So he went from killing Christians and jailing them to preaching the gospel and getting them saved. By 13 AD, the church had become dead, social, and powerless. The absence of real evangelism brought about the greatest corruption of government and mankind the world had ever seen. It wasn't until the reformation of the church actually began to the return to biblical evangelism. Now, I don't know about you, but I started thinking about a lot of this stuff and comparing it, and I watched our church fall asleep, the church as a whole. And all the stuff that happened that came out that the, I believe the enemy brought about... Uh, Woke the, started waking the church up, at least some of it. There were some of them that had gone off, hooked up with it, whatever. But it was a time to wake up. We had a shake up to wake up. How many believe that? Now, I want to look at this and see what happened. And I, I see a few things that started. How many know that Reformation started with Martin Luther in 1517? How many are Lutherans here? Come on, yeah. But we know that that wasn't the start necessarily of the Great Awakening, but that was the start of the Reformation of the church when Martin Luther challenged that and nailed his 95 Theses up to the church door. Uh, we started rolling heads. And, and he preached a message of justification by faith. How many know the only way you can be justified is by putting faith in Jesus? Church didn't like that message. They wanted you to have to go through them at the time. Uh, and the first great awakening happened between 1710 to 1780. How many remember George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers? And there, there were more. But they started this great awakening that went about 70 years. The power of God was moving. Signs and wonders were happening. People were hearing the gospel. Uh, the second great awakening was between about 
1810 to 1870. How many remember Charles Finney? And, and there was many others, and it resulted in a civil war. Isn't that amazing? We can have revival, and it turns into a civil war. I don't know what this revival is going to turn into, but it could be pretty wild. It could cause things, because right now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen the evil of a government operate like they're operating right now in this nation. I would have never thought it would have happened. But church fell asleep, now the church is waking up. Come on, you waking up, church? And so we saw that second great awakening, but now we are in a third great awakening. Somebody say we're in a third great awakening. And I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but that's why we get to be led by the Spirit. That's why we got to reach out to people with the supernatural operating through us on a daily basis. And it could be messy out there. How many know it could be messy with what's going on? I, I mean, who would ever thought that the standing president would have left all those people in Afghanistan? Who would ever thought something like that would have happened? Millions of dollars worth of equipment, high-tech equipment that would have been left there. So I'm saying to you now, we've got a choice to make. Are we going to be part of this third great awakening? And are we going to reach a nation again, allowing the supernatural to operate? And I'm going to talk about that today because that was something that God put on my heart. So it says here in Acts 10.38, well, first I want to read this. It became a spiritual force again by changing nations through changing hearts. How many know if we allow God to have our heart, nations can be changed? In Acts 10.38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Now what I want to do is take it and insert your name in there. How God anointed Dennis with the Holy Ghost and with power, come on, who went around doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil because God was with me. Are you, are you guys with God here on this? So the same anointing that Jesus have, I'm telling you, you got. How many believe that? We talk about most places we've been, we're trying to do everything to get God's anointing, but Jesus through what happened is death, burial, and resurrection, we got his anointing. Anybody thankful for that? So what was Jesus trying to accomplish here? Jesus was setting an example by being the exact representation of the Father to humanity. He was our prototype. So what Jesus did is what we're to be doing. Did Jesus go around putting sickness on people? Did Jesus... Put poverty on people. Jesus blessed them. Jesus healed them. Jesus delivered them. So he set the example, the prototype for us, so we got what he did to follow. This is what we are doing. You know, I, I think, though, the difference of a lot of times between us doing this supernatural is, and Jesus, the difference was the motivation of our hearts. How many know that we've got to bring out and expose the motivations of our heart of why we want to do what we do? The difference of experiencing God's grace and walking in it is the motivations of your heart. Are you going to allow God's motivations to become your motivations? How many want to see this third great awakening rock and roll in our era, in our time? Okay, it starts with our heart. If we don't deal with the thoughts and intents of our hearts, with the beliefs of our hearts, we're not going to get to experience this like God wants us to. Stepping into personal ministry should be an outgrowth of each stage of personal growth. How many here want to keep growing? You want to keep dealing with stuff, putting off the things that aren't working for you, and aren't of God, to putting on what Jesus said will work. Wholeness should be expressed in part by accepting personal responsibility. Now, that's where we probably had a few gulps. You mean we got to be personally responsible? Mm -hmm. 
We've got to be personally responsible for the influence you have with other people. How many know the more you step into being a leader, the more influence you have over people? And we need to be responsible for that in this hour. How many want to get positions and say, look at me, or you want to see other people grow up and prosper? Robert Hall, got to watch him through the years, and he got to hang out with Dave Duell. He got to spend some time with him. He watched how Dave did things and released things to people. And then when Dave went on, how do you know Robert kept going? I mean, on trains all throughout India, places of Africa. Failure to accept our responsibility as personal ministers of the gospel causes us to lose the sense of freshness and excitement we once had in the Lord. So God, I pray, I don't want to lose my sense of being responsible. I want to get, gain a revelation of the responsibility I have with other people. Anybody out here? John 3, 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Or another way of saying that, he gave him the Spirit without measure. What about you? I mentioned Dave a minute ago, and I remember him talking about that verse, and he said, Jesus had the Spirit without measure. Do I? And God said, that's not the right question. It's not, do you have all the Spirit? Do I have all of you? I mean, when you're fully surrendered to God, man, you got his spirit full, complete, it's on. You know, so often people talk about a double anointing. I want to get a triple anointing. I want, give me more, Lord. Do you know when you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got all you need? See, the Old Testament, it was a different deal. The Spirit showed up and left. Now, when I receive the Holy Spirit, I've got the person of the Spirit on the inside of me. I've got all that Jesus had. I don't need to be doubly anointed. i got it all. Come on, how about you? So we live in a day when the Holy Spirit is freely poured out on all men. You believe that? The Spirit of God is not given in measure. Somebody say the Holy Spirit is a person. You believe that? And do you believe you got all of him? He said, Holy Spirit, I want you. See, Jesus operated in compassion. There's no snow showboating. Jesus was not trying to show, look at me, look what I can do. Did anybody ever see Jesus do that? Did he start rubbing his things? Look, look how cool I am. Jesus had the Father's heart. He was trying to minister to people in their lives. He was expressing the Father's heart to a lost and dying world. How many know we got a lost and dying world? How many know we got people in fear right now? I remember when 9-11 hit. Man, the churches started really filling up until everything was cool, close call, but everything's cool. Same people that rushed in because of fear left. And I'm saying people are freaking out right now. And you, somebody say you is me have the answer by the Holy Ghost to bring faith to them at what Jesus did. We need to be praying. Did somebody say September 11th was coming up? Yeah. Prayer on the National Mall. Sean Foyt has got to take his worship there. I mean, people are saying, no, we're going to celebrate this. I showed you the piece a few weeks ago, I think, where it showed uh, FEMA put up a statement that said if you're if you believe in 9-11 or celebrating that thing or holidays, Christmas holidays, or what was the other one? If you believe Donald Trump should have been president I'm, I'm, or that it was fraud. It put it all in here. I saw it on, uh, it was on uh, Victory News, but it came from NBC News. I took a picture of it. If that's the case, you could be a terrorist. His Homeland Security had this up and wrote this. And I thought, am I really seeing this? Am I really believing this that's happening? Trying to change your brain. And I, I'm telling you, they're overstepping their boundaries on this stuff. Yeah, if you're opposition 
to COVID guidelines, then you could be a terrorist. Now, let's, let's look at this here. Motivation of compassion. In this hour, compassion must flow. I, I looked at this and I wanted to operate in how Jesus operated, and I saw so many places where compassion flowed and then we saw the supernatural happening. First of all, does anybody want to see the supernatural operate? I mean, a couple of you, okay? Uh, and I don't mean shows. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how Jesus operated, compassion flowed. So the motivation he had in Matthew 14, 14, and verse 13 says, When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place, but the crowds found out about it and followed him on foot from the towns. Then he stepped ashore and saw a large crowd. He had, what's this word now, compassion on them and healed their sick. I mean, these people who heard about Jesus, they're following him. Give Jesus a break, man. Give him a day off. Do something here. But he saw them and had compassion on them and healed their sick. When evening had come, the disciples came to him and said, hey, this is a desolate place. There aren't any McDonald's down the street. No fish and chips places, Lord. But they said, he said, it's already late. Dismiss the crowd so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And what did Jesus say? You give them something to eat. Now, most of us, if we don't have the concept that we can multiply fish dinner. Come on. I mean, we think well, that was back then. I'm telling you now, we need to be prepared to do whatever God says to do. If he says feed the crowd, we need to be prepared to feed the crowd. Jesus himself had to go to the Father. And it said he looked up. And he saw what the Father did. And then he, give me the loaves, let's bless them and pass them out, boys. Now, are some of you here thinking about how we can see more of what happened in the Bible that Jesus did happen in our daily lives? Or are you thinking, well, that time's over, or not much of that going on? I'm here to disagree, humbly disagree with you. Now it's time to start operating in what Jesus did on a daily basis. And Jesus did it by the motivation of compassion so God help that be my motivation. There's a lot of hurting people, a lot of people freaking out right now as a result of what happened with all the things that went on in Afghanistan and with the soldiers. We've been getting reports because of our son-in-law, who was a special forces guy, of a lot of these wives are calling in from these ex-soldiers and they're really having a tough time with this. I mean... Some of them, the, the thought of suicide and those kind of things because of what's going on right now. They, they just can't believe it's happening and our government is doing this. So we need to have compassion with what we're called to do. Come on. Now that was first thing was Jesus feeding the 5,000. The crowd sought him out because they heard of the miracles. We are now in a similar place where the people are looking for help in miracles in the midst of their trials. What would you do if you didn't know God and you were out there in the midst of all the craziness that's going on? Man, you're looking for somebody that could give you the truth and show you how you could feed your family and show you how you could get a job when they told you you can't have one. I, I'm, I'm saying to you there's needs, there are people out there, and it's our turn now. We get to be those people that are out there meeting the needs of people. It says, Jesus had compassion on them. For us to see miracles that really helps people, how many want to see miracles that really helps people? We have to ask God for compassion and his heart. God cares about people. Say that with me. God cares about people. And I don't want something that I can work up or, oh, compassion. I need to let God's heart be my heart. Can, 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 will you open to let God's heart be your heart? And when he prompts you by the Spirit to walk over and encourage this brother or, or help him however he needs help, are you open to that? 
You know, Jesus restored sight. When Jesus looked to God, it says he was restoring sight. And we need to restore sight daily. And I need to just let you know this. There's a difference between compassion and duty or obligation. It's easy to say, this is my duty, and you'll pull it off, and you'll, you'll get in there and get tough. But we're not talking about obligation. We don't be obligated. You want to get God's heart and then walk that out. And then there's power in the Spirit when it's made it to heart level for you. You're going to see more miracles. You're going to see people's lives change more than you've ever seen before. So to anoint means to rub on. The Old Testament saints only received an anointing. How many know those Old Testament saints were able to do something? But the Holy Spirit showed up back then. He did the work and then he left. How many know we got something a little better? They never experienced the full measure of the Spirit like you and I get to. Jesus, not the Old Testament saint, is our model. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Is anybody out there like that today? You know, I'm just thinking of Cassie, got in, stayed up all night. She got in early this morning to come to church. And, and there's a lot of people that need ministry at a hospital right now. But it says here, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Is what you're doing, is what I'm doing, bringing people rest and removing their burdens? See, I, I've got to look at ministry that I have and the people that I'm connecting to. Am I teaching them a bunch of intellectual knowledge or am I bringing rest unto their souls? Is what you're telling people causing them and making them feel like they've got to do more to get from God or are they putting their trust in what Jesus already did and resting in that? Resting in the finished work. Is that our message? Is that what we're telling people? Come on. Luke chapter 7, starting at 12. And when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, a dead child or man was, it's not clear on just how old the person was, was being carried out. The only son of his mother, she was a widow. A large crowd from the city was with her. Now, I just want to point out this. You've got a widow, and her son's gone. That means she barely has a need or a way of making finances to support herself. She's kind of becomes almost a beggar at that point unless she's got relatives that will take her in. So this was a big deal, having not only not having a husband, but losing your only son. And it said, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. How many know that when I see somebody in a need and they are weeping, God is sending me there to bring a solution? How many know that you got the Holy Ghost in you and you got the ability to bring a solution to what that person's going through? You know, I, just hearing Robert say, we've prayed for how many people and COVID was healed? You know, we saw a few people go. I, I know people that have died with it. We had somebody in this church pass away with it. Uh, and I'm saying to you, we've got the power to restore people and heal people. Does anybody believe that? See, see we're, we're, once you jump into that realm of being afraid of what you might get, you slip out of the realm of being afraid of what they might get from you. And I'm saying we have the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us and we need to be stepping out and trusting God. Are you with me? I'm not saying not use wisdom or, or be stupid, but we need to step out in the Holy Ghost. It says, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. I, I, we see this and say Jesus did that. 
Have you ever touched somebody when they were in a coffin and prayed for them? I have. And I've seen people get goofy with it and, you know, try to cause stirs in funeral homes and stuff. You want, you know, you're not stirring up. We're not getting attention. We're just praying for people. We're, we're speaking life to those people. And then it goes on to say, he touched the coffin. And those who carried, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, and what do we do? Is he praying to God? Is he, no, he's speaking what he wants to happen. And young man, I say to you, arise. Now, you, compassion first started this, and that's when he was moved at heart level. He saw the need. And then he acted on it. He was exact representation of the Father, and that was, it's not my will that your son die before his time. How many have been to the funerals and heard people talk about, well, God needed another angel, or he needed another plant in heaven? That's baloney. That kid's mom needed him. Are you hearing me? That, that person's husband needed him. It, it's... So what we want to be able to do is get God's will, and we know this is God's will. Jesus demonstrated it here. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came on all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. How many know that you need to be those people that are following through with that, and when that happens, people say, oh my God, God was here. God showed up. I, I can't tell you the, the times I've seen 15-year-old, I'm sure I've shared this before, in Brazil, I'm, I'm trying to wonder if Robert was on that trip, and we're in this town, we go into this church, and there's no roof on it, so you're seeing the stars up there, had a great meeting, prayed for people, and these this uh, brother and sister who were 15 years old, they were albino, so very white in a very dark community. This is Brazilian. You got the photograph. And so I said, what do you want through the interpreter? We want our sight. We're blind. The whole time they were doing this through the service, and I thought, well, maybe it's just hard for them to see because of the light, you know? And they couldn't see. And, and make a long story short, God healed both their eyes and gave them new eyes. Now, I, I just want you to say, now, what this does is everybody says, hey, man, that really happened. We've known these guys since they were born. Look what God did. You, and the next part I'm trying to say is, with the same compassion of God, you can do that, and you should be doing that, walking out, because there are mothers just like this that are looking for somebody to pray for their son, daughter. So what keeps that from happening? Fear of man is a snare. Boy, I tell you, since this pandemic started, fear has been the tool that has sucked more people into it than any other thing. You have to stand against fear, and you do that by knowing God and allowing the faith of God Crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, no, not I, but Christ liveth in me for the life that I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not even my faith anymore. I live by the faith of the Son of God. So when Jesus gets an unction and it starts working inside of me, who am I to say, no, I'm not going to go pray for that person? What if they don't get healed? Is that your problem? Our job is to lay hand on people. Now, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you to stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set us, his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. How many here have God's spirit in their heart? So that is a seal of ownership. So that makes, I'm God's, right? 
He's put his spirit in my heart as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. God, I thank you for that guarantee. And you never roll out on your guarantees. That's in me. And so, God, I can take faith steps knowing that you're, you're right with me, Lord. Paul never claimed to have different or better anointing. How many know you get the same anointing that Paul had? You have Jesus' anointing, right? He only claimed to have a different responsibility. You guys have different responsibilities depending on what your job titles are. We all have the same anointing. It's the one we receive when we receive Jesus. Who believes that? The question is not, does God have compassion on us? But will I let that compassion flow through them, flow through me to these other people? Will I let the compassion that's already on the inside of me flow out of me? God already has it, but is, am I going to let him use it through me? Anybody out there? Will you let God's compassion flow through you? Now, I'm going to tell you this story. I've been there many times to India. We have a guy that we work with, Sylvie Kathapali. And I wasn't on this particular trip, but Dan, who we were just with, Thompson, and Ed Shirley were there. And they came walking up, and so these pastors were gathered around this one guy, and he needed to be delivered, this guy. And this was the story they gave me, and I have no reason. To, he killed 37 people, and most of them were policemen. That probably uh, can get you pretty good, uh, get you in trouble, wouldn't you think? And so everybody knew this guy, and so they were up, and they were ready to start casting the devils out. In the name of Jesus, man, they were ready to go to town on this guy and cast the devil out. And part of them were probably a little nervous because he'd killed all these people. And so Dan walks over there, and this guy's eyes are kind of rolling back in his head. How many know that's a good sign? I've seen that one other time in Mexico, man, this gal that, that got delivered right there. And, and no, no, buddy, we went on to glorify the devil. He's a chump, right? But the time I saw it happen and this girl was walking up to the front, her eyes rolled back in her head, and then I watched that spirit turn the Coleman lantern off. It goes poof. And the guys we were working with were in Mexico with David Hogan and those guys, and he looked at me and he said, you see that devil? I mean, these guys got excited when the devil would manifest. And so prayed for her and got her delivered, right? So this guy's starting to manifest, and these guys are ready to go Duke City with this devil, man. And Dan said to Ed, why don't you give him the love of a father? Ed's a big guy, but that wasn't a deal. This Ed reaches around this guy and just started loving him with the love of a father. Pretty soon this guy was fully and completely delivered. Today this guy with his wife and children go to the church there. Now I'm, I'm not talking about putting on shows. I'm not talking about look what I can do. I'm talking about are you ready to let the love and compassion of the Lord flow through you to set people free. I mean, we're talking about serious devils here, man. This is like the Ganderines demoniac from the amount of people that this guy has killed. I mean, the cops were scared of him. And I'm glad Ed just moved with compassion, reached around this guy and hugged him. Can a hug deliver somebody? Or do we have to have this mapped out prayer? You got to say it a certain way. In the name of my, I mean, you've got to use certain enunciation. We serve you notice. And, and, and I'm saying that the love of God cut through all that. Are you with me? GP, are you with me? And, and, and I've seen this stuff and done this stuff, and I'm just telling you, God's love is what trumps anything. Are, are, you, are you with me? Come on now. So this guy is still delivered. Somebody talked to him just the other day. This guy's still coming to church with his family. Um, this guy, because he killed so many cops, it was like the Lord spoke to me. He had a hatred 
against authority. You know, we got a lot of that going on right now that's rising up and manifesting out there. That's why I believe we had so many policemen killed and all the hatred trying to get them to not have jobs. Man, this same devil was trying to operate there. But it's not going to, is it? If love doesn't work, manipulation and control won't. How many believe love never fails? Come on. Matthew 15, 32, and Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. This is when he fed the 4,000. Now what this says to me is Jesus cared about people's basic needs. Do we care for people's basic needs? If, if I've got the means to help somebody, so I don't even think you have to pray sometimes. Come on. Let me pray in the Holy Ghost to see if I'm to buy your lunch. Y you know, it should be a natural outflow of who God is in you. The flood victims need our help, Denise says. I mean, there was a lot of people that got left, left to dry, literally, down in New Orleans and those areas. Uh, New York got hit really hard. So, so there's needs that need to be met. So God, how, how are we to help with that? Uh, sometimes compassion must be tough. Now I see a few women sitting up saying, you better believe it does. I didn't mean just women, okay. <laughs> and the point is, we don't want to longer enable the problem that people have. Sometimes you got to get tough with people, man. We're going to trust God. We're going to walk with God. The angriest Jesus got was at the Pharisees when he came to the temple and saw all the misuse of God's church by greedy businessmen and Pharisees. Isn't that kind of what's going on right now in our government? Jesus turned the tables over. Upset. Now, now I'm going to throw this out at you, and some of you might manifest a little, but that's okay. There's a time when we must take a stand. And, and I've got this little sentence in there. I don't know if it's up there for you. Hopefully it's not. Do we ever have to use actual force? Do we ever have to go in... Uh, we mentioned this earlier in the service that there were a lot of servicemen being called. There were special missions of, of past uh, army forces and special forces people that had to go in and literally bring these people out and it's still going on right now. They're, they're having to re-strategize. But how many know there's a time when compassion has to be tough and you've got to go across the enemy lines so that others can be set free? These are people that we're having to escape Afghanistan. So what's our compassion? There were so many groups that were helping with this effort, that were going over there. Uh, Kenneth Copeland got a lot of criticism uh, for having a jet, first of all. And he lent that jet uh, to several people, Glenn Beck being one of them, David Barton, and this team that was going over there to do this. And he also didn't just do that, but he gave them $15 million in this operation. Time that needed to step up and do something, they did it. And I know this one particular group we had brought about 12,000 out. I know 5,100 of them were believers that were able to escape. Over there, believers, as you all knew, they were going around from house to house. If you were a believer, they'd bring you out in front of everybody and cut your head off, torture you, whatever they needed to do to put the biggest spectacle on. And so there are people over there hiding right now. Other Christians thought they're going to kill us anyway, so they decided to go from house to house preaching, giving the gospel out, knowing that that could be their life and probably would be modern-day martyrs, if you will. So I'm saying... When do we get to that place where compassion in our heart causes us not to care or fear what the enemy might do to us? What can man do to me? This I know that God is for us. How many believe that? 
And are we ready to do what it takes? Are, are we in that place now where we're going to be bold in this last day? Are you with me? In Acts 3, 10, excuse me, 1, Acts 3, 1 to 10, it says, And Peter and John went together in the temple in the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. You all should know this story. To ask alms. And from those he entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them, with John and Peter said, Look at us. So we gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold we do not have, but what I have I give to thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. That's pretty bold, isn't it? And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He's, he's, so he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he who was sat begging alms at the gate beautiful at the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is a guy that you saw every day. Everybody knew him. This guy was there. Oh, that's that beggar again. That's that beggar again. But today something happened. And this goes against a lot of stuff because Somebody that's been that way a long time in the natural, it's hard for them to see themselves any other way than the way they are. And so this guy, they pulled him up, and God did a miracle in that place. Now, this didn't create any small stir. From that, we had a crowd, and they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many know miracles can make way for you to tell about Jesus? And... If I'm not mistaken, 5,000 people heard the gospel or received the Lord. I mean, no, that's pretty good out of this miracle that happened. Pretty big thing that was going on there. But then some religious people heard about it. Sadducees, Pharisees, different ones. And they brought them to the Sanhedrin, arguing with them, threw them in jail, beat them a little bit. Next day, they, they brought them to court, and it said, with boldness. How many know boldness needs to be part of what, it's already part of what you got. Somebody say, boldness is already mine in Jesus' name. And they got bold and they presented the gospel to all these religious people. And all more people got to hear it. So are we going to be afraid of what they might do to us? Or are we going to say, God, by your spirit, I'm going to boldly preach your good news. I thank you that boldness is mine. Of course, they didn't want any stir. They saw the people listening, so they just kind of tried to send them away. But then these guys got with their people, and they prayed for a spirit. As a matter of fact, let me read that. In Acts 4, it says... So when they heard that they had raised their voice to God with one accord, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things and the kings on earth uh, took their stand and the rulers were gathered together. So we've got them praying and going on and, and it says 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. I've, I've seen the place where I was shaken a few times, but it was an earthquake. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Now, we're being brought to a place right now where we're going to be in fear of faith. Are we going to be bold? We just got back from a conference, Buffalo Boldness. You know, a buffalo, when it gets into an attack, like with a bear or something, a bear is starting to attack it, 
they got a way of shifting that hump in their back uh, in, in different places in their body, and it secretes oil. And so like when this, let's say, bear would come to try to attack it, a lot of whatever would try to do, hold it, the oil would cause it to slip and fall off of it. So then the buffalo would get a hold of it. How many of you know that you and I have that same anointing oil, no matter what we're going through, so when times get tough, so when we get challenged, man, that anointing oil makes it to where the enemy can't hold on to you. Come on, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'll have to do some of this next week because I'm getting, but I just want to say there's an overflow principle. If you... Fill your heart with God to capacity. Come on. <laughs> it will start to overflow. Ministry is not something you make yourself do. It will flow forth from what you are. What have you been filling yourself with? Because that's going to be the overflow principle. And God's love is what I'm learning how to allow to stay in my heart, to manifest in my heart, and be that overflow. So when I see people, God, miracles just flow because of that. Father, I just thank you for the people that are here, the people listening online, and we just thank you, God, that we thank you that we have the compassion of Jesus. And we just choose to let that saturate the inside of us, our heart, God, let it saturate that. So when I'm walking out, I'll be sensitive to that still, small voice. God, let it flow. Let it flow. How many want to let the compassion of God flow through them? How many want to let the compassion of God just flow through them on a daily basis, wherever you are, whoever you are? Come on, Jesus. We thank you for that. If you don't know Jesus or need to be filled with the Spirit, you're listening online, just, just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. And you died for me. You rose again from the dead delivering me from my sin. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling me, forgiving me, setting me free, that I can walk in your spirit. Thank you for saving me, Lord. Thank you for filling me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What we're going to do now is we're going to have communion.